we've heard uh, already from Glinda and uh, from Sheila Watson uh, on this issue of fuel economy baseline. I remember, so 10 years, sorry, actually 12 years ago, when uh, Cleaner Asia did this report on uh, fuel economy for ASEAN. Maybe a bit of a background story. At that time, uh, the Global Fuel Economy Initiative was uh, recently set up and it's supporting major car markets. And we, uh, sorry, uh, Cleaner Asia, I was part of Cleaner Asia then, uh, together with Sudir Gota, uh, Alvin Meya, we were looking at this issue because no, there were very few development organizations looking at Southeast Asia. But if you look at it collectively, like, okay, India has, what, 1.4 billion people, China has 1.4 billion people, Southeast Asia has 650 million people. It also has substantial uh, motorization and challenges and also contributions to uh, CO2 air pollution. But at the same time, uh, there is a great opportunity to make sure that the countries in Southeast Asia put in place these, these policies on fuel economy or sustainable transport early on in their uh, trajectory for um, economic development. And uh, yeah, I think uh, fortunately, and as we've seen, uh, many of the countries in Southeast Asia have developed this kind of policies and have contributed to minimizing uh, increase in CO2 emissions, but also air pollution from transport. I will not repeat uh, points of uh, uh, from Sheila Watson. I just really wanted to show this slide uh, Sheila Watson uh, provided some uh, background to this. So initially, the Global Fuel Economy Initiative had uh, a focus on light-duty vehicles, rightly so, because light-duty vehicles, as you know, contribute significantly to uh, motorization in advanced countries, in developing countries. And uh, it was more like 50% uh, improvement of the fuel economy of the global light-duty fleet. Uh, in 2050. But uh, three years ago, the Global Fuel Economy Initiative looked at their targets and uh, rightly so, uh, integrated other transport modes, especially the two and three wheeler uh, vehicle segment uh, or modes, which is very relevant for Asian countries, heavy duty, heavy duty vehicles, uh, and also um, transit buses or buses in general. But if you look at this, uh, decarbonizing road transport to tackle climate change this section it's uh, it's it's reference to non-motorized transport cycling and walking integration of uh, uh, renewable energy into the uh, 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 into the fuel in fueling uh, vehicles is also very important and now it has been integrated This chart, uh, the chart on the right side was also shown by uh, Sheila. This is something general. And the point that I wanted to make here is uh, the Global Fuel Economy Initiative, its partners have uh, highlighted this issue in improving road efficiency for new light duty vehicles. This is a bit of a struggle for us when ASPIN, UNEP, Cleaner Asia, other organizations who are supporting countries. Because when we go into a country, and discuss fuel economy. Everybody wants to look at the entire transport sector and they would raise their hands and say, okay, what about the in-use vehicles? We are pro you are promoting uh, more efficient vehicles, but what about the in-use vehicles? So I wanted to highlight this because it, the fuel economy baseline um, development and policy development uh, focuses on looking at the new light duty vehicle registrations. For certain years, I will have some slides to look into uh, uh, in more detail on this. But it's imperative that we know what kind of vehicles are coming in our countries so that we can make sure that future, like the new vehicles coming after two years, after three years, will be more efficient. We acknowledge that there is an issue on in-use uh, vehicle emissions, uh, air pollution, but also CO2 uh, and other issues of transport. Um, but on this uh, topic, on fuel economy, we focus our attention on the new vehicles that are coming in, in the hope that in the next five years, in the next 10 years, we are not going to talk about the same thing again. Uh, the left hand uh, looks at uh, uh, 
the efficiency of the fleet, like liters in 100 kilometers. Maybe I just highlight uh, the blue line is ICE policy potential, meaning this is the conventional vehicles that we have on the road. And considering what countries have promised so far, and targets, uh, looking at targets in uh, EU, in China, in India, uh, South Korea, and other big markets, uh, this is the potential of uh, the conventional vehicles. If you look at the right uh, graph, this is the equivalent in terms of uh, CO2 emissions uh, for the vehicles. So you have efficiency on light uh, liters per hundred kilometers, and then you have CO2 emissions on the other side. If you look at the green line, uh, and this is the um, ICE plus electric vehicle policy potential, uh, meaning if we electrify transport. And on the right side, the equivalent is the dotted green line, which is like the moderate scenario. And the green line, the solid green line, is the aggressive scenario. And this is uh, where we can potentially end up if we put in place uh, this kind of policies. A bit more on this. Uh, these are the, in terms of uh, targets in 2030 and 2050 for new vehicles by type uh, compared to the 2005 levels. No? So we have the cars, the trucks, the buses, and the two and three wheelers. And in the analysis of uh, the Global Fuel Economy Initiative and its partners, uh, we have uh, come up with uh, these efficiency targets and equivalent CO2 um, and potential reduction in 2030, 2035, and also in 2050. But what is important uh, to look, look into this chart is if you look at the nodes, this already integrates electric vehicles with electricity converted to gallon equivalent. So we have also made an effort to consider and to see what can be uh, the impact of uh, integrating electric vehicles into the fleet. It could be more, definitely, if uh, uh, the growth of electric vehicles in countries are uh, more aggressive. But what is happening in advanced and emerging countries? The IEA is one of the key partners of the Global Fuel Economy Initiative. They keep a database uh, mostly for OECD countries or advanced countries, if you like that looks at what is the fuel economy of the light duty vehicle fleet. It's a very robust uh, database and they've had information going back a number of years, actually even before 2010. But this is from the latest uh, information that we have from IAA. You can see, for example, Canada starting at 9.5 liters per 100 kilometer in 2010. Uh, you have the United States, 9.5 similar. North American countries have had historically very high, uh, or I should say very low uh, fuel efficiency of the light duty vehicle fleet for a number of reasons. Maybe we can uh, look at this in more detail later. But we also have here countries from Asia, like China and India, uh, South Korea and uh, Japan. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, one for Southeast Asia collectively and uh, or for other developing countries as part of this chart. Maybe in the future we will have this. Uh, but this just shows, compared to the global average, what is the uh, performance of uh, the different countries. If you see, the global average in 2010 is 8 liters per 100 kilometer. And in 2017, it has become 7.2 uh, liters per 100 kilometer. Very limited uh, improvement. And if you look at the, the targets of the GFEI, uh, which is quite, uh, the rate of improvement needs to be at 3.7% in order to achieve the 4.4 liters per 100 kilometer target in 2030. So definitely more has to be done. But one thing that we are increasingly acknowledging is that there is more to be done also in the developed, or maybe I should say North American countries like Canada and the United States, where they have uh, inefficient vehicles. If you look at India, uh, China, uh, South Korea, uh, Japan, uh, the numbers are uh, improving uh, quite uh, well as well. Um, before I go into this, one more point. Uh, but there, I don't have a slide on this, but I wanted to uh, share this with you as well. 
But one thing that we are also looking at is this concept or, well, it's not a concept. It's what's happening in many countries is the influx of uh, SUVs or these uh, urban cars which have 2,400 cc, 3,000 uh, cc, 4,000 cc, and big cars that are coming into the market. Um, this is especially seen in, again, North American countries, but it is also increasingly happening in uh, many Asian countries. And if we cannot avert this, definitely the fuel economy averages of developing countries will also not be improving substantially. Gasoline prices are quite uh, important these days, no? so that's also why I wanted to show this. In the work that we did in uh, many countries, if I can highlight the Philippines, uh, we supported the Department of Finance's uh, efforts to promote uh, vehicle excise tax, progressive vehicle excise tax, but also a progressive fuel tax. Fuel taxes are seen as also an important fuel economy measure. So it uh, if you have more taxes, it encourages more efficient use of fuel in the countries. For example, if you look at this graph, you will have uh, efficient vehicles in Japan and Korea, uh, Germany, United Kingdom, uh, these developed countries, but they also tax this uh, it, they also tax fuel quite highly. Uh, and this is what we have in terms of information for uh, other countries. Developing countries like Indonesia, uh, you see that uh, gasoline price is quite low. Uh, and you also see that fuel efficiency is quite high. Uh, and that means its fuel is being inefficiently used. Of course, we realize many countries are doing this also to generate funds to generate uh, more funds for uh, government expenses. But uh, at the same time, we need to look at this holistically, meaning there are the transport sector, especially in the urban area, who uses uh, fuel uh, more. And you will see that these are usually upper middle class, uh, uh, high class or high income tax, uh, sorry, high income uh, people who have cars and who always use cars in traveling. So if, we, if you just uh, uh, put a tax on the, uh, fuel, on gasoline, and uh, we are able to hopefully uh, change the behavior of this uh, sector of society to use fuel more efficiently. What are uh, fuel economy policies? I think uh, since I'm making this overview presentation, I would like to use a few more minutes uh, in terms of uh, explaining this. We also use this many times in uh, the countries where we're uh, in supporting. So fuel efficiency standards, uh, fiscal measures, these are fuel taxes and vehicle excise taxes, as I mentioned, market-based approaches, information measures. These are all very important uh, fuel economy policies that countries can consider in promoting uh, better fuel efficiency. And they work. I think that's the SM, that's the main message of this slide. These are some data that we have for um, countries that we have supported or we are supporting. And the dotted lines are targets from uh, the EU, uh, China, uh, and the US. Uh, but you can see, for example, the uh, the top line uh, this is for mongolia and you can see substantial improvement in the fleet and this was just because of uh, the influx of many hybrid vehicles in the market these are second hand uh, hybrid vehicles coming from japan you have information for the philippines although the in, uh, improvement is not really substantial you have kenya you have mauritius you have sri lanka we will have some uh, case studies on this later, and we will hear more about their experience. This slide I will not go into detail, but uh, one thing that is being asked of us in UNEP, uh, in GFEI, is to see, okay, what has been the impact of uh, the activities that you have been doing? We have supported now 70 countries, the developing countries. 
And uh, Sheila said uh, 100 countries, and this includes the advanced countries. So GFEI also supports the advanced countries, the major car markets. Uh, the, our partner, the International Council for Clean Transport, International Energy Agency, have been the ones who have been supporting these uh, advanced countries more. Uh, but the UNEP has been focusing their efforts on developing countries. And uh, this assessment that we are doing is actually ongoing. Uh, we are working with Sudir Gota, who I'm sure many of you know, uh, to, lead, to look at the impact of uh, the work that we are doing. I will uh, show some uh, slides uh, today uh, on this. Uh, but just to show in terms of uh, what we are doing in this kind of analysis. We are looking at sales data, as I mentioned, new, new cars, new LDV sales coming into the market. And just to show the information that we have from uh, each country and what OICA, this is the International Organization of Vehicle Manufacturers, uh, have. And uh, as you can see, it is uh, very close. And uh, what we even see is uh, considering the information that we have, there are more sales or more vehicles coming into the market. We also look at uh, average engine sizes and again, gram CO2 emissions per kilometer. This is very similar to one chart that I showed uh, a while ago that looks at uh, uh, efficiency and uh, gasoline prices. Now this is engine size and uh, uh, CO2 uh, of cars. It's very similar. There is a trend that as you have more like bigger vehicles or bigger engine vehicles, then you also have higher CO2 or gram CO2 per kilometer. And if you look at the top corner, uh, the right top corner of the chart, Belize, Nauru, Cambodia, Botswana, Nigeria, Uganda, these are all developing countries that actually would want to have more savings in terms of fuel. But unfortunately, they don't have the policies in place to encourage uh, adoption of more efficient vehicles. Cambodia, for example, like 90% of the fleet uh, would be imported secondhand. Majority of this comes from the US. And majority of these vehicles are like, what, 2,400, 3,000 cc, 4,000 cc. And you use it for daily travel only in Phnom Phen, which is a relatively flat uh, area. Uh, so again, uh, this um, highlights the inefficient use of uh, fuel and uh, of transport. So we have started to look at uh, the impact of these uh, uh, activities that we have supported. The red line is like uh, before we have supported uh, the countries. The yellow line is uh, after we have supported the countries. And the green line is like the target of the GFEI. And uh, yeah, you can see we, we have achieved some, uh, I could even say significant reductions because we have supported the countries. But there needs to be more. Uh, that has to be done in terms of promoting more efficient uh, vehicles in the countries. My next sets of slides, slowly, I, I know that I'm uh, over time, but uh, I'm taking this opportunity because our next presenter actually will not be able to make it. Uh, he has some personal uh, difficulties in making the presentation. This is the one for Latin America. We would have liked to have that presentation because it would highlight the experience in Chile. Uh, but unfortunately, we don't have the presentation. So let me take a few more uh, minutes for the slides. Many of you will also have seen this uh, next sets of slides because this is what we show in uh, terms of developing the fuel economy baseline. What is the coverage? This is always the issue. We start with light duty vehicles. We have done some for heavy duty vehicles. We have, we have uh, also done some now for two and three wheelers. Unfortunately, we don't have comprehensive or uh, more resources to just support country in uh, looking at the baseline for all transport modes. Uh, but this is something that we will have to look into. Barriers is always there, like the challenges. Ma many times this is the availability of data and uh, this is a struggle for many countries. I would even say most uh, countries. Some would have uh, the vehicle registration data as uh, outdated mode in terms of recording. So we would need to go back and look at this uh, hand recorded uh, uh, database and put it in a Excel based or spreadsheet based database. Some countries uh, 
don't own don't own their own vehicle registration database sometimes it's with the a private company who is supporting the government in uh, running this vehicle registration database and sometimes what is available is only only basic information like the type of car uh, the type of fuel that, that it uses so this is um, some of the challenges that we have to grapple with and uh, in almost all cases uh, the fuel economy data itself it is not uh, available uh, in the country but just to say like all the vehicle manufacturers they have tests and they have information on the fuel economy of each vehicle so for all our government representatives that are here you can easily mandate or ask these vehicle manufacturers what is the fuel economy of this vehicle and as such you can you can uh, have a more robust database for each country so what does this entail? I mentioned that this is the database that uh, we are setting up. You have information on the different models, the engine size, uh, the power of the engine, the, this, the fuel type, the transmission, emission standard, and uh, also this fuel economy data. It doesn't have to be exact. And uh, what happens in practice is uh, we borrow information from other countries that have the same type of vehicle for example a volkswagen polo that is available also in the philippines but also available in indonesia then we, we can use this uh, uh, information the methodology is there uh, and there are many examples and we are able to share this uh, in terms of uh, developing the, the baseline methodology minimum data requirements and nice to have uh, I think I've mentioned many of these things, but increasingly uh, what we also need to look at is this vehicle footprint and vehicle weight, because this negatively influences uh, fuel economy. And as we see, and as I mentioned, the SUV phenomenon, or I call it SUVization of the vehicle fleet, uh, is impacting heavily on the overall uh, fuel economy of the fleet. And then uh, yeah, this uh, chart just shows the fuel economy data. Ideally, uh, if you look at the, the bullets at the bottom, we try to cover 85% of the newly registered vehicles in this kind of database. But this is very hard to achieve. Only a few countries that we've worked with are able to do this. Um, but nevertheless, we work with what we have. And, and uh, not surprisingly, in all of the countries that we work with, they they have not done this uh, this type of analysis. But this type of analysis, as we know now, is very important in developing uh, fuel economy, vehicle excise tax uh, policies, uh, and others. This is uh, some uh, information on where we can find the fuel economy data. And just for my last slide, uh, as a summary. Um, maybe I've mentioned many of these things already, but I go back to this business. Uh, I think it's a business management uh, quotation. You can't manage what you can't measure. Or maybe in our case, what we should say is you can't manage effectively what you can't measure properly. And if you look at this uh, caricature that I just chose, like you have equations, you have data. Uh, if you cannot explain what is happening, maybe you just refer to it then a miracle, of course, if you believe in miracles. But uh, this is just to highlight that for Asia, or actually for developing countries, we need to look at this issue of properly documenting or, or, or putting into a database the kind of vehicles that, is, we, that we are having. I mentioned the relevance of the baseline in developing vehicle and fuel policies, uh, this database that needs to be uh, maintained, uh, but uh, monitored and updated, as ideally by, uh, by government agencies. We can always get help from research institutes, uh, universities, but the ultimate responsibility should lie with the government in terms of having this database and updating this. And then maybe lastly, it will become even more important as all of our countries have pledged nationally determined contributions uh, to the United Nations Framework for Climate Convention. Um, 
reductions of CO2 from the transport sector. We also have air pollution targets or air pollution uh, uh, goals. And we need this kind of information in order to see what will be the impact of the policies or what are, what have been the impacts of these policies. I think I stop here. And uh, thank you very much for bearing with me in uh, going through these uh, slides.